We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts. So in just a few moments, I hope you can join me in Acts chapter 23. We'll be looking at the first 15 verses of Acts 23 tonight. So I hope you can meet me there. And I hope to see you for worship this coming Sunday at 9 or 11 a.m. And I hope all of you can be present for a class in between those two services at 10 o'clock as well. And we are continuing in our study of the exploits of King David. It's been a good class so far. I'm looking forward to this one. And for our members, uh, remember to use the Sign Up Genius account, if at all possible, to sign up for one of the two worship services. And remember, guests are always welcome at that. If you don't have access to the Sign Up Genius, that is okay, but it does help us to uh, try to make sure that we have kind of an even number at each service, giving us some room to spread out. Uh, tonight we are continuing in our study of the book of Acts, and so this is the Acts of the Apostles, more accurately, some of the Acts of some of the Apostles, and we're uh, looking at the Acts of Peter in the first third of the book, the Acts of Paul in the last two thirds of the book, and the book is written by Luke, the beloved physician, to a man by the name of Theophilus, so just giving Theophilus a history of the early church. By way of very brief review, the ABCs of Acts is our memory tool for this class, and we've, uh, we've assigned a successive letter of the alphabet for each chapter in this book as a memory tool. Uh, so up to this point, we've looked at the ascension, the beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, great hero, how can I, I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom includes Gentiles, liberated again, missionary sent out, not gods but men, old law not binding, Philippian jailer converted, uh, questions answered in Athens, reasoning with a preacher, saving our religious friends, Troas on the Lord's Day, uproar in Jerusalem, valuable citizenship. And tonight we continue with Acts chapter 23, which is waiting to kill Paul. So the letter W, waiting to kill Paul. And just to bring us up to speed here on the last few of these, Paul is nearly killed by a mob in the temple courtyard in Acts 21. That's the uproar in Jerusalem. He's rescued by a Roman centurion. He's given permission to speak to the crowd, which he does, telling his story in Acts 22. Uh, obviously, they still aren't happy with that, and so the centurion orders Paul to be scourged so that they can figure out what in the world he's done. And at the last possible moment, Paul reminds the commander that he is a Roman citizen, immediately saving him from the scourging. So this is the valuable citizenship in Acts chapter 22. In the very last verse last week, in Acts 22.30, Luke says this, But on the next day, wishing to know for certain why he had been accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priest and the council to assemble and brought Paul down and set him before them. And so this brings us up to where we are tonight as the Roman commander arranges a more formal meeting between Paul and the Jewish ruling council. So it's not Paul versus the mob at this point, but it's Paul versus the council, the Sanhedrin. And so he's brought here in a more formal setting, and he's given the opportunity to explain himself. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 23, verses 1 through 5. So the first paragraph tonight, Acts 23, verses 1 through 5. Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those standing beside him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? But the bystander said, Do you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Up in verse 1, Paul uh, skips any kind of flowery introduction. Uh, he is respectful with the term brothers, but he jumps right into it with this statement, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. In other words, uh, Paul always did what he thought to be right. And I think that reminds us that the conscience is not always a safe guide, is it? And we have controversy on that today. Many people today will suggest that we just need to do whatever we think is right. Uh, live your truth before the Lord and just do the best that you can and things will work out in the end. We just follow the conscience. 
And if something feels like the right thing to do, then we just do it. And if something feels like a bad thing to do, then we just don't do it. And we'll be good with that. However, we need to understand that for Paul, doing what he thought was right involved traveling all over the Mediterranean world, dragging Christians out of their homes and back to Jerusalem to be persecuted simply for being Christian. And Jesus even warned the apostles about this on the night before he died back in John 16, 2 and 3, when Jesus gave them this warning, they will make you outcast from the synagogue, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. And that reminds us that we can do a terribly evil thing, all the while thinking that we're doing a very good thing. And that is exactly what Paul did, and it's exactly what Jesus warned his apostles would happen to them. We need to understand, though, uh, what the conscience is. And I think this is a good time to uh, give us a little reminder here, a little... Um, kind of update on what the uh, conscience actually is and what it does. Uh, the conscience is something of a moral compass. That may be one way of describing it. And like a compass, it always points somewhere, right? And a compass has that arrow on it, and it's always pointing somewhere. So like a compass, the compass, uh, the conscience gives us direction in life. The problem is, sometimes the direction that it gives us can be wrong. Sometimes the direction can be mistaken. Uh, my dad taught me that there's no such thing as a perfect illustration. In other words, any illustration we use uh, has a way of breaking down if we press it too far. So there's no such thing as a perfect illustration. But think about an actual compass. We understand that a compass can be wrong. Generally speaking, we trust what our compass tells us. But we may be out in the wilderness and I might be standing next to some gigantic magnetic rock. And if that's the case, the compass is going to point to that rock, not necessarily pointing directly to the north. So that's an illustration of that truth. If we're using the compass in a city, uh, imagine being downtown Madison. A compass might be affected by a large building, and so it may point to this building instead of pointing north as we expect it to do. And so that arrow that is supposedly pointing north is not really pointing north and yet that arrow is still giving me direction isn't it it's still pointing somewhere it's a wrong direction uh, but it is suggesting a direction well i think we could compare that to the human conscience the human conscience is very similar to that uh, when making some kind of moral decision my conscience will almost always tell me to go one of several directions so i have this feeling that this over here is the right way to go However, we need to understand that the conscience can be wrong. Uh, I can even make a terribly wrong decision and feel really, really good about it uh, the whole time. And we see this today. People can do terrible things, uh, thinking that they're doing the right thing, uh, when their right or their concept of right doesn't really match up with what is actually right or right in the eyes of God. Uh, this is what happened to Paul. What he thought was right was actually wrong. And so he was doing wrong while thinking that he was right. And that's what he explains up there in verse 1. And uh, this reminds us that the conscience can be a safe guide as long as it has been properly trained or properly educated, we might say. And I think this is probably the most important lesson we can ever learn about the conscience. The conscience is a safe guide only insofar as it has been properly trained. So going back to the compass illustration, the compass is a safe guide, but only to the extent that that little arrow pointing north is actually pointing north. And I hope that illustration makes sense, at least a little bit. Uh, sometimes I picture the conscience as a Y. So the little stem on the Y and the, to the two arms going to the left and to the right. And so, if I picture it as a Y like that, kind of like a fork in the road, in my mind, the conscience will always suggest taking the fork to the right. The problem is, whatever is out there on the right might actually be wrong if my conscience has been improperly trained or improperly educated. If, for example, my parents taught me from a young age that lying is good, if they train me to lie to get myself out of trouble, if they showed me by their own example that lying is totally fine, well, then as an adult, uh, I can face a moral decision concerning whether I should tell a lie 
and I might be able to lie with a perfectly good conscience, right? I can take that road to the right, thinking that's the right thing to do, when if I've been trained that that's uh, right when it's actually wrong, I could think that I'm doing right when I'm actually doing wrong. Well, uh, thankfully, however, my parents did not teach me this. I need to be very clear on that tonight, I suppose. Uh, they very clearly taught me that lying is wrong. And so when I face a moral decision today that involves the possibility of lying, uh, my conscience will always point toward telling the truth. Uh, now the question is, do I always have to follow my conscience? Uh, obviously, no. There are times when my conscience tells me what to do and I choose to ignore it. And so there are times when I might choose to lie even if I know it's wrong. Well, obviously, that's bad. But what's really bad is that if I do that long enough, what happens? If I lie and I lie and I lie even when I know that I shouldn't, well, I may end up with what the Bible describes as a seared conscience. And so like a callus on my hand that comes from splitting firewood, you know, um, I might lose feeling in that area. And so the next time I face a moral decision about lying, I might not care anymore. I can ignore my conscience so long, but the conscience no longer gives me any direction. And so the conscience is no longer relevant to me. And that's not a good situation at all. In fact, uh, Paul warns about this in 1 Timothy 4, 1, 2, and 3. But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. And so we learn from that, that there are some people out there today who teach what is false, thinking the whole time that they are teaching what is right because their conscience has been seared. And so they were mistaken at some point in the past. Maybe they felt bad about that at some point in the past. But they've taught what they teach for so long that they don't care anymore. And so the conscience is seared. And so they've lost their moral compass. Or more accurately, so or more accurately we would say their compass is actually wrong now. And so the, the conscience can be ignored to the point where there's no feeling in it. To the point where it does no good. Or my conscience might be retrained either in a good way or a bad way. If I hang out with people who lie all the time, I might eventually change my opinion about lying. Even though my parents told me it was wrong, if I hang out with liars 24-7, I might get to a point after a few months or years where, where I don't care about that. And I might move lying from uh, the, the wrong side to the right side of that why. Or if I grew up thinking lying is okay, I might read the Bible and come to the conclusion that lying is bad. So thus, changing my conscience in a good way, moving what I feel is right uh, to what I now feel is wrong and kind of swapping places there. I know it sounds kind of complicated then. And again, I think the summary is the conscience can be a safe guide as long as it has been properly trained. But even if properly trained, the conscience can always be ignored. And that's where guilt comes in. If I do what I feel to be wrong, I feel guilty. And, uh, and if this, this really does work both ways, I should point out here, I can do what's right and still feel guilty about it if I think that what's right is actually wrong. And uh, we see this in several of Paul's letters with the uh, eating of meat that's been sacrificed to idols. Uh, somebody could come from an idol-worshiping background. They may think that it's a sin to eat meat that's been sacrificed to an idol, when, of course, to us as Christians, that really doesn't matter, scripturally speaking. But Paul gives some instruction on that. Ideally, we can retrain their conscience over time on that matter. Uh, but in the meantime, I probably shouldn't invite my formerly idol-worshipping neighbor uh, for an idol meat barbecue. They might feel guilty for doing something that was never really wrong. And they might feel guilty enough to actually uh, cause some spiritual damage. So guilt can work in a good way or a bad way. Well, the conscience, I think, is an interesting study, and we could spend all night looking at this, but I just bring it up here because of what Paul says in verse 1, that he's lived his life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. So what we uh, feel uh, might actually be wrong, and we just need to be aware of this. We need to make sure that the conscience is properly trained or properly educated. And Paul had something of a retraining of the conscience, didn't he, when he met the Lord and made that conversion into Christianity. Well, as a result of this statement, the high priest orders those beside Paul to strike him on the mouth. So instead of answering Paul's argument, he just beat him physically, just had him punched in the face. 
And uh, we're seeing some parallels between this and the so-called trial of Jesus. It's not much of a trial if you get punched in the face every time you say something in court that the court doesn't want to hear. But that seems to be the way this is going. And so this is just the opening line. And uh, all Paul said was that he lived his life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. This apparently touches a nerve. Uh, obviously, Paul is claiming to be okay with God when they very, they very clearly think that he isn't. Uh, but also what he says here might be causing these men to realize that they themselves have not always lived with a good conscience before God. And it's a rare thing, I think, to say that you've always lived your life with a good conscience before God. Um, can you say that you have never violated your own conscience in this life? That you've always done what you thought to be right? I can't say that. I, many times in my life I knew the right thing to do and did not do it. Uh, but Paul said that uh, this is the case for him, that he's lived his life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this point. So that's a pretty bold claim, uh, not a claim that most of us can make, but it's a, a claim that basically accuses these men of opposing God. So if Paul is really living with a good conscience before God, if he really is good with God right now, these men are putting him on trial for obeying God. So Paul's implication is, you people have consciences that are improperly trained. You are opposing God. And so, therefore, they just punch him in the face. Uh, in response, Paul, I don't know, we may say retaliates a bit. That may not be the best way of putting that, but he has a response to that. Uh, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Uh, do you sit to try me according to the law and in violation of the law order me to be struck? Well, he's got a good point, doesn't he? He comes pretty close to just quoting Jesus here with the whitewash comment. And the violation of the law comment, Jesus accused the Pharisees of being whitewashed tombs in Matthew 23, 27, and 28. Uh, back then, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Uh, we can almost see Jesus in Paul here. He's right and he's bold. Uh, just as the Lord was. Uh, those nearby, though, call Paul out on this. Uh, do you revile God's high priest? And I think that's about as close as we will ever get to an apology. Uh, what comes next here? Personally, I don't see this as what's coming here as an apology. Some have argued that Paul is mistaken. Um, I don't I don't see it that way. And I say this because Jesus had told the apostles in Luke 12, 11 and 12, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So my opinion is the Holy Spirit told Paul to say this. And so there's no need for him to apologize. But Paul does explain. Um, this is more, it's far more of an explanation than it is an apology. Um, I was not aware, brethren, that he was a high priest. Actually, I added a word in the Bible there. I'd want to back up there. I was not aware, brethren, that he was high priest. doesn't say a high priest, but I was not aware that he was high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So notice he doesn't apologize for what he said, but he explains what he said. And in his explanation, I almost see something of an accusation. Uh, maybe it's just me, but it's almost as if Paul is saying, if the high priest had been acting like a high priest... <laughs> I might have recognized him as a high priest, but since he wasn't acting very high priestly, that's why I said what I said. So again, more of an explanation than an actual apology. Uh, some have suggested this was uh, maybe a quickly called meeting, so everybody was kind of dressed in their street clothes. The high priest wasn't wearing his official garments. Maybe that's why he didn't recognize him. Uh, some have said that the high priest was maybe behind Paul that Paul was out front, the high priest, that voice came from behind him, so he didn't see him. Some said, well, Paul couldn't see or recognize because of his bad eyesight. And that's all speculation. It, it may or may not be true. Uh, we do know from Jewish history that Ananias, this high priest, uh, was one of the most corrupt that they'd ever had. He took bribes. He was abusive. He was actually recalled to Rome to answer charges of abusing the Samaritans. I think we learn about that in the uh, Roman historian Josephus. Um, not too long after this, when the Romans attacked Jerusalem in 67 AD, this man was apparently murdered, assassinated by his own people. So the Jews killed this man before the Romans could. They hated him so much. So I don't know, but we do know that Paul leaves it at that. So I, could, I, I would lean toward Paul saying this uh, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he was not mistaken to say what he said here, but uh, implying kind of surprise that someone so corrupt 
could actually be the high priest. But Paul does quote scripture, and we've got that going for him here, which is certainly more than these men have done up to this point. That quote, by the way, comes from Exodus 22, 28. So let's continue with Acts 23, verses 6 through 10. The next paragraph here, Acts 23, 6 through 10. But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. As he said this, there occurred a dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all, and there occurred a great uproar, and some of the scribes of the Pharisaic party stood up and began to argue heatedly, saying, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. And as a great dissension was developing, the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. And to me, this is absolutely awesome. So uh, just as Paul is, has customized his message on the Areopagus to try to reach the pagan philosophers, the reference to the unknown God and all that, uh, so also here, after getting punched in the face, he can clearly see where this is going. So I would just want us to imagine, what if this trial had progressed as a trial? What if they had called witnesses? They could have very easily put him to death like Jesus or like Stephen. But to me, at least, it seems Paul can see where this is going, perhaps by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so he decides to take a new avenue here, kind of to make his own way. He decides to split the crowd in half and uh, kind of have them attack each other instead of attacking him. Brilliant move. So he sees that he's dealing with two groups. He's very familiar with this. He was one of them. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he's a Pharisee. This is his background. Uh, he knows they're divided on the resurrection, so he comes out and he just lights the place on fire. <laughs> Uh, brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. This is what they're all about. And I do find it interesting how Luke has to explain this to Theophilus in verse 8. And thankfully he does, because this is the clearest explanation we have of this. Uh, as an outsider, as a Gentile, Theophilus kind of would be clueless. Well, why did they go nuts over this? And so Luke explains, and this is the most concise summary we have in the Bible concerning what the Pharisees and Sadducees actually believe. So Luke kind of summarizes it for his first reader. Uh, the Pharisees believe in the resurrection. Sadducees um, do not believe in it. And uh, the Pharisees also believe in angels and the spirit world and so on. But the Sadducees don't. That's why they are sad, you see. At least that's how we remember it in English. So Paul intentionally throws this proceeding into absolute, complete chaos. In verse 9, in fact, uh, Luke describes it as a great uproar. As I understand it, the word in Greek for uproar is something of an onomatopoeia, uh, which that word is hard enough to say, uh, but the word in Greek actually sounds like the sound it is describing. So uh, onomatopoeia, the word buzz in English, sounds like the word that a bee might actually make. A buzz, The word buzz sounds like buzzing. And uh, this word in Greek means scream, great uproar, it means scream. And the word actually sounds somewhat like the screech that a crow might make. <laughs> and so these men were squawking like crows. And notice here they stand up. So they're now standing up and yelling, screaming at each other with the Pharisees taking Paul's side. Not that they agree with Paul completely here. They don't. But they're now more mad at the Sadducees than they are with Paul. And their concern is, what if an angel... Or what if a spirit has spoken to Paul? Well, they don't know the half of it, do they? Um, but who are they to argue with the spirit? And so they kind of, you know, uh, go out like that. And with this, the commander, he's once again afraid that these people are going to rip Paul limb from limb. And so the commander once again goes down, rescues Paul from the crowd by force, ordering that he be brought back into the barracks. And I'm trying to imagine what's going through Paul's mind right now. This is incredibly stressful. And he's been at the point of death by a mob twice now, just in the last couple chapters in just a few days. And the only thing keeping him safe at this point is his Roman citizenship. And, and the Romans are known to do whatever is practical sometimes. I mean, after all, that's how Jesus got crucified. So Paul has to be on edge here. He's got to be somewhat nervous and afraid. And this brings us to verse 11. So let's pick up tonight with Acts 23, verse 11. Acts 23, 11. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side and said, Take courage, 
For as you have solemnly witnessed to my cause at Jerusalem, so you must witness at Rome also. The way I see this, if Jesus stands by Paul's side in the night and gives him some encouragement, it's probably because Paul needed some encouragement. In other words, I think it's probably safe for us to assume that Paul was pretty concerned, maybe even somewhat anxious at this point. And so if he's told to take courage, I'm thinking it's probably because there's a good chance that he, he had a little bit of a courage deficit in his life right at this moment. As I remember, Jesus has appeared to Paul at least three times previously in this book, if I've counted correctly. We've got uh, on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. We've got in Corinth in Acts 18, when Jesus tells him not to be afraid. I've got many people in this city. And then we have the reference in the temple in Acts 22, which I think gets inserted chronologically before the other. Uh, where Jesus tells him to get out of Jerusalem since the people wouldn't accept his testimony. And then the fourth reference is here in Acts chapter 23. So we've got Jesus appearing to Paul a number of times in Acts. Uh, the new information here is that Paul will testify on the Lord's behalf in Rome, uh, just as he has in Jerusalem. So this sets the stage for the rest of the book of Acts. Paul is now on his way to Rome, although it will take a bit to get there. He's about to get an, an all-expense-paid trip to Rome. Uh, with transportation provided by the Roman Empire itself. So no fundraising for this trip. He's, uh, he's going as a prisoner, so he's going courtesy of the Roman government. But let's conclude tonight with a, just a few more verses. Acts 23, 12 through 15. Acts 23, 12 through 15. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who formed this plot. They came to the chief priest and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn oath to taste nothing until we have killed Paul. Now therefore you and the council notify the commander to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case by a more thorough investigation. And we for our part are ready to slay him before he comes near the place. Well, I find it interesting that Jesus tells Paul that he's heading to Rome. And the very next morning, a group of Jewish men take an oath that they won't eat until they kill Paul. So basically, somebody's going to die. Either it's Paul or it's us. I kind of think of a kid promising to hold his breath until he gets what he wants. Not a very realistic promise, is it? Um, but it is this plot that eventually sends Paul to Rome. He pleads for Roman protection to be tried by Caesar and all that. We'll get to that over the next few chapters here. So they think they're killing Paul, but they're actually participating in God's plan to have Paul preach in the city of Rome. And I, again, I find that interesting. So Jesus appears to Paul and says, hey, you're going to Rome. The very next morning, these Jews form a plot which results in this plan where Paul ends up going to Rome. So we've got 40 men who agree to this. Instead of anything remotely resembling justice, they work behind the scenes with the chief priests to make this happen. We've already established that Ananias is corrupt based on secular history. Um, and they plot together to have the chief priest tell the commander they want to continue this investigation. And as Paul is being transferred uh, from the barracks to the temple, these men will ambush Paul and kill him. So we've got a bit of a cliffhanger here, don't we? And I uh, hope to pick up with the rest of this account next week, if the Lord wills. Uh, but tonight we've looked at the first half of Acts 23, and now we understand the heading to the ABCs of Acts. So waiting to kill Paul. So 40 men are now waiting to kill Paul, and that's what goes on here in Acts chapter 23. Uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. I hope, again, you could be with us for worship on Sunday at either 9 or 11, and also for the Bible class at 10. And let me know if we have anything for the bulletin. I usually try to get that done Saturday afternoon or evening. Uh, but uh, the soonest you can get those to me is the better, the sooner the better, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the one and only Almighty God. We're thankful that you've made us with the ability to choose freely between right and wrong. We're thankful for the conscience, and we pray that we will continually train the conscience correctly, using your inspired word as our only guide. We're thankful for the resurrection of the dead. We understand tonight that you are, in fact, the God of life. Thank you, Father, for your book, and thank you for Luke, and thank you for Luke's record of the growth in the history of the early church. In Jesus we pray. Amen.